we're going to bring everybody out, and I want to take just one minute to introduce everybody because I've got a really interesting, diverse group, and I want to be sure and, uh, and tell you about each one so you know who you're talking to. Uh, first is uh, Jana Hartline from Toyota Motor America. I think she's in a... And uh, I think we've got a one-minute video on you. In addition, yeah, you're gonna get a minute from me and a minute video also. Oh, it's marketing, what are you gonna do? See. <laughs> <laughs> winter has given us beauty. Next up, Jamaica in their first winter games. Hope. And heroes. Winter has given us joy. And miracles. Winter has given us the magic of the Winter Games. It's time we all did more to protect it. So at Toyota, we are renewing our commitment to hybrid, electric, and hydrogen vehicles to help keep our winters winter. When we're free to move, anything is possible. Yeah. Just a little bit about Jana too. Um, and I apologize for reading it, but I want to be sure I get everything in. Jan is the Advanced Technology Vehicle Marketing Manager for Toyota. She's responsible for creating and, devel and developing sales strategy, marketing plans, and merchandising support for the Prius, Prius Prime, and Mirai uh, hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cell. Jana joined Toyota in 2000 as a head safety engineer, as a health and safety engineer. Mm -hmm. Prior to joining the marketing team, she managed environmental communications with responsibility for advanced technology and, initi and initiatives for environmental issues, including fuel cells, plug-ins, batteries, electric vehicles, and environmental partnerships. Jana, Jana earned her uh, master's in environmental science and management and uh, from UCSB, and her BS in Ocean and Coastal Re Resource Management from Texas A&M Galveston. I think she's a perfect person for this panel. Uh, just fits right in. Uh, a trained in an engineer, a trained uh, environmentalist, uh, not a car girl, and, uh, but has spent her, her whole career at Toyota and has matched up her passion with a company that cares and wants to make those changes too. Thanks. It's a big surprise who's coming out next, so I'll wait and see who pops out. <laughs> I think it's Drew. I'll wing it if you just... Hey. <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hey. hey. <laughs> Tom Sebastian. Hi, Tom. How are you? Drew Fitzgerald. Hi, guys. <laughs> Kevin Buckler. And Garrett Melby. And again, let me just go through one minute on, uh, on each of them. On uh, Tom, Tom is the co-CEO and global head of content at Swirl, uh, Megami Bowen, uh, where he leads creative uh, growth and development. Tom's a connector of people and ideas, and he has a vast network of experience across entertainment, advertising, and media. Tom comes from the William uh, Morris Agency originally, where he led creative development in the firm's corporate consulting. He has a great understanding of how entertainment is, is, uh, is packaged and how brands can participate in entertainment, content, and pop culture. Early on, he was a pioneer in the creation of digital advertising systems in some of the country's largest retailers, Walmart, Costco, Best Buy, Ralph's, all of them. So thank you very much. Great, great background. Uh, Drew Fitzgerald, and I'm gonna go, I'll start with Drew and then I'll just taper off because the, the, the bio goes on too long. Uh, but I'll just start with, with, with my buddy Drew. Um, Drew is one of the co-founders of Just, uh, formed to drive positive social and environmental impact in everyday items while creating awareness around energy, food, and water. Just's first major project, Just Water, everybody's got one there, he got made sure of that. Just water was started to reduce the plastic use and emissions in, in thank you, photo, photo, was in bottled water packaging, simultaneously changing the way water is acquired by creating the first public and private water model in history to assure that water is ethically sourced and, con and uh, conserved. Uh, also creative director for the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. 
uh, uh, ad creative advisor and cre creative advisor to MIT Plasma Science and Nuclear Fission Center. You see why I wrote it down. <laughs> I summarize all that with, he, he hangs out with a lot of scientists that are really, really bright, and he's the storyteller. <laughs> so, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Kevin, Kevin's our, our wallflower on the group. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, Kevin is, uh, started out in the 90s uh, and started a, a, a very successful wine, Adobe Road uh, Winery, um, primarily out of Silicon, the Silicon Valley, out of uh, Sonoma. Uh, Kevin tells a, a story about how he, he spent 15 years developing it and then became an overnight success when it finally took off, and now it's a highly rated wine, and uh, I'll tell you more about him and the wine later. Uh, at the same time, he started the Racers Group, TRG, and had a very successful run, a history of class wins at Daytona and Le Mans, on the way to an overall first place in 2003 at the Rolex 24-hour Daytona. So not just a racer, but an accomplished winner and racer. After many years with Porsche and sports cars, he expanded into NASCAR, both Sprint Cup and uh, Truck Series. And he'll visit today with us a little about the, both the wine business and uh, the transformation in the racing industry that was uh, certainly not a, not a green industry. And last, but uh, again, just a, such, a, such an interesting, diverse uh, background, Garrett Melby. Garrett brings a really interesting and different background today. Um, his first degree was from Yale and then a law degree from Boston University. Then he had a very successful two-decade career as a venture capitalist. In 2004, he founded Good Company Ventures. After a fairly harsh business climate with, as, as a VC, uh, he was drawn to where he would make his mark and change in the world. He was able to design a breakthrough model where he brought capitalist principles to the nonprofit world. A startup accelerator with a twist, if you will. They would, they would only back startups that truly sought to do as much social good as making money. Thus, good, good corp. He was able to teach young startups by grooming, mentoring, how to attract capital, marrying two diverse entities that would, have a natural, that would not have a natural communication to launch and, uh, and, and help them thrive. So really, thanks, and what a, what a cool way to expand uh, your footprint by starting all these other guys up underneath you. So, so uh, thanks, and we'll jump into uh, some questions. All right. Terrific. Uh, first one for everybody, easy one. All of you come, all of us, I'll include me, come from industries that are not necessarily considered green. Mm -hmm. uh, did you set out with a goal to change that or was the, was the environmental aspect of it kind of personal and came from within? I'll start and just go left to right. Okay. And thanks, Mike. I, I'll keep my answers brief because there's a lot of us and I want everybody to have time. <laughs> but um, I could talk about that one for 10 minutes on my own. You got one. I got one. <laughs> so um, I was really lucky. Obviously, I'm an environmentalist by background and so it was really important for me to find a place and a uh, corporation that had that ethos already. Mm -hmm. So I was very lucky to get on board with Toyota where it sounds cliche, but it's actually part of our DNA. And Toyota has been working on efficiencies and, and greening processes and reducing waste since way before it was trendy. I mean, back in the 60s, there were environmental committees around manufacturing. And that's something that a lot of people don't know about. So really, I was lucky to come into an organization that already had that built into their structure. And it's something that we look at with every single project and everything that we do. Okay. So, Thanks. Yeah. Tom. Well, I think I, I'd love to say that I woke up one day and I had this passion and I was driven, and, <laughs> but I, it, that would be, not be true. Um, I worked for William Morris and uh, William Morris Endeavor, and I was assigned to this uh, individual named Lawrence Bender who uh, worked on an inconvenient truth. Mm -hmm. And so I was sent over um, to meet Lawrence, and he was hosting a he was hosting an event, not dissimilar to this. Um, it was called 17seconds.org, and it was, the premise of it was that it took 17 seconds to change all the light bulbs in your house. Hmm. And um, so I went over, I listened to Lawrence, and all these big companies were there, uh, um, Lowe's and, and Home Depot and, uh, let's see, Lowe's, Home Depot, and uh, Walmart were all there working together side by side. And uh, the moderator, who some of you might know, was a guy by the name of Jib Ellison. And, Jib coined this phrase, big good. And here were all these gigantic companies that were thinking about how they could make a difference into the, in the world. And I was so inspired by that and this notion of big good that I wondered what else we could do. 
but it was by happenstance. It was, um, <laughs> it was being witness to it in a room like this. I, different than Jana's company, which has been around as a long legacy in history, I was an entrepreneur with a startup. So it was a lot easier and a lot more uh, agile for me to say, let's look at a problem in the market and let's create something similar that's going to fix it immediately. So it was, it, it, was, it was a conscious choice looking at the industry overall to say there is a problem here and we can fix it and let's create something from the ground up with the DNA to be better and improve from, a, from an ethical standpoint, from a social standpoint, from an environmental standpoint. So for me it was a lot easier I think than a large multinational to turn on a dot. So that's part of my entrepreneurial spirit is I only want to be involved with things that are impactful. Cool. Kevin. So uh, the answer is, uh, you know, honestly, no. We started a winery because we wanted to make darn good wine. <laughs> but, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to try some tonight. But um, no, interesting with our industry, though, especially the wine business, how I'd say self-policing the industry has become. You know, the vineyards that we purchase fruit from are very self, uh, they're on the eco side. They're very self-sustainable. Most of them practice all of the best practices they can. But remember, these people are planting year after year after year and have to make sure that there are accomplishing both their business goals and also keeping up with all of the eco-friendly programs they have. There's pressure from policy, there's pressure from politics, there's pressure from purchasers, but I think that the industry in general is very self-policing, does a good job. The, your, the, the, your big famous wine, the grape, is Bergstoffer? Be Beckstoffer. Beckstoffer, and I think they're they're, they're, they're very much oriented. Yeah, it's the, I, say, I always say Andy is the most famous guy in the wine world. You've never heard of. The, um, he's the grower in Napa with the most amount of uh, uh, land, and it's very expensive and really hard to get the grapes and really, really a lot of money. But um, he actually stewards his brand. If you use his name on the bottle, you actually have to pay a second time. It's kind of a funny little pro program. But, um, uh, yeah, they control a big part of Napa, and they have a lot of, pro a lot of uh, property up in Mendocino as, as well, which is very, very uh, friendly up there. So. Yet. Well, I, um, as you, thanks for the introduction. I, I had about 20 years of um, business and finance experience that I was proud of, but a, a track record that I wasn't proud of. So about 10 years ago, I uh, had an assessment of how I could have the most impact going forward. And, and sort of, this is a, a challenge for everyone in the room um, at a certain point in your career. What's your greatest point of leverage? And, and what I observed was that in this nascent venture philanthropy impact investing market. There were a lot of passionate young entrepreneurs that were coming out of social service or science and they didn't know how to build a business. And so that was our strategy. Can we get some of these guys funded? And so to date we've delivered over a hundred million dollars to these uh, social entrepreneurs. And I'll, I'll just share one anecdote this summer. Um, sort of mission accomplished moment. We had the um, venture firm Andreessen Horowitz, probably the top venture firm in the country right now. Ben Horowitz tweeted out that he just made the most important investment that he'd ever made in his entire life. And this was one of three companies that they funded from us uh, in the last year, uh, promoting food stamp access, migrant remittances, and low income housing redevelopment. And so the idea that we could get the venture community to view these kind of social causes as bankable was yeah. sort of our goal. Excellent. Yeah, I love that, that, that you're able to bring that marriage <coughs> together. That's just really, really a cool idea. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, second one. Mm -hmm. How can a company brand itself as caring about our planet, even if they don't sell a, an eco-friendly product or service? So you perfect one. Let's, and I'll have you two kind of take a little bit longer lead on it. And yeah, that's a really great question. Um, Again, I'll go back to kind of Toyota's DNA, and really, we do, obviously, we have many eco-friendly products, let's um, Prius, and that was, a, that was a real turning point, I feel like, for us in the US in, in particular, um, when we launched the Hybrid Synergy Drive, and that was you know, a, a huge moment for Toyota, and that's how we connected with Emma 20 plus years ago. Mm -hmm. But um, I think really, from our perspective, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that people don't know uh, beyond product. We are a full line manufacturer, which means that we make everything from the Prius to the Tundra which is a very large truck. So it's a challenge to ensure that people understand who we are as a company and that we're trying to serve the needs of a multitude of customers across the nation and around the, around the world, quite honestly. But like the video that we saw earlier, um, ensuring that people understand we have a environmental challenge that we've set for ourselves to create a net positive impact on the planet by 
2050. And we are moving forward with changing what mobility looks like and changing how we do business. And so that's something that we are integrating into all of our marketing and making sure that our, that our customers understand who we are as a company and where we're going in the future. Okay. Tom, how can you brand if, if you're not necessary, if, how, can you, how can that brand <coughs> take place? But, you know, I think people generally, everybody wants to do the right thing. And mm -hmm. um, individuals and companies, and, you know, being in the advertising world and the marketing world and the storytelling world, if you go to a client and you say, hey, listen, we have this idea that would be really amazing for you to get involved in, mm -hmm. and let me show you something. It could be a little piece of film, or let me show you something that that um, you can be proud to take home and you can be proud to say, hey, I was part of this thing. Um, me, personally, I was like, and I think um, making it, taking it way out of here and, and making it super personal mm -hmm. personal, um, yeah. and showing it to them mm -hmm. because people really want to be involved and um, create something positive. So I think, you know, positivity begets positivity and if you just show them it to them, they, you know, people will... People will die. Yeah. In my world, it was it was real important for me to show people how easy it was to change. So we put charging stations around at all the dealerships, and just you know, trying to taught everybody that it wasn't that weird. It was mm -mm. different, but but wasn't that hard to change. Mm -hmm. yeah. True. To build kind of on what Tom said, you know, you you think take, let's take someone like Dick Sporting Goods, right? What are they going to do? Go source leather for Rawlings baseball mitts? That's not their business, right? <clears throat> but there's ways to look at it and say, well, striving to be Patagonia or something isn't realistic for a company like that. However, what, where we are now is looking at the way your bottom line works. What environmental uh, revisions can you put in, like water reuse, obviously maybe electrifying your fleet, solar arrays, et cetera, community solar, being involved with those types of things, can really affect your bottom line where your CFO will be like, yeah, let's do this. This is ridiculous. It doesn't have to be a badge value of green. And then to build on what Tom said, I think it's a good thing for all of us in this room to understand that whenever, that environmental impact and social impact go hand in hand. And when a social impact can be just helping people or it can be criminal justice reform. There are things that when people are motivated towards a cause, whether it's eco or social, you have a group that is, is marching in the right direction. So I think if you have a low quotient for green impact, look at social causes in your area. That mm -hmm. motivates people, makes people happy, fuller lives, and that's what we need, I think, uh, collectively. So. Kevin. You know, again, from our industry, from the wine industry, from the growers all the way to what we are, we're a producer. So we get to make choices along the way that stay within our window of corporate sustainability and also uh, if we make our decisions to try to be as eco-friendly as we can. So just as a little education on how it works, starting at the top of the bottle down, the tin that we use, uh, we can make a choice to use tin, plastic. Most of our bottles are tin. The tin's recyclable 100%. Uh, the little piece that goes and holds the wine in, the little cork, we actually... Uh, source these, um, the French government has sustainable forest programs. And so our young, amazing winemaker, who you guys will get to meet tonight, he's upstairs, I think, setting up. Mm -hmm. uh, he just, we sent him on a trip to France and he actually went through the French forests, choosing the, the cork from the trees. So this cork came from a tree that's still growing in the ground that's regrowing its cork right now. It's part of the bark. Mm -hmm. And obviously the bottles are completely recyclable. And these are, you know, things that are normal with our industry, but along the way we can make uh, decisions and changes on the way we do things. Even little things like when we, those grapes, that get crushed and the juice that comes out, those big bins of grapes, sometimes those are thrown away. We take them to an extra little effort from us. They're hauled away, put into a compost situation and recycled back into the ground. Mm -hmm. So ours is pretty clean all the way through, yeah. exception of some of the plastic that we have on the top of a few of the bottles, but that's a little bit of branding and marketing. But um, yeah, again, our industry has been pretty good. Uh, it can always be better on the pesticides within the ground. You know, again, it's, it's going to be, a CFO is going to say, this is how far we can go. And here's an area where if we have to push too hard to be 100% it's too much labor, it's too much work, so those people making those decisions on their own decision. Yeah, I, would, I would echo everyone's sentiments. It's not an all or nothing game. Um, in our impact investing world, it's always an equation of people, planet, and profits, and those have to all be supported uh, equally. Um, I would recommend to folks that aren't familiar with it the, the B Corp uh, measurement system, which is kind of a 360 assessment, so it's not good enough to be producing the right product if you're not doing it the right way. And I would echo the sort of cultural comments of the entrepreneurs uh, earlier and um, um, the... Um, 
uh, Ian's observation from an investment point of view, if your business opportunity is so thin that you can't afford to do the right thing the right way, mm -hmm. you're gonna have a problem uh, mm -hmm. sooner rather than later with your culture and with your company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good, good point. Um, <laughs> Drew, maybe hit this one for you, please. How does green messaging fit into your overall marketing strategy? Uh, do you keep it subtle, or do you hit it pretty hard? No, I, I mean, this question's kind of a layup for me because I, we built this thing as an, the environment yeah. first, you know, <laughs> and, so, and then we were like, let's do more and let's have social impact and do it, Drink. you know, in a small town that needs manufacturing income. And when, so let's put this aside, but when you go and you work with MIT, <clears throat> you see a lot of people that are constantly looking at petri dishes and microscopes and looking at business models, and they don't necessarily know that the, 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 the question of technology is a question of humanity, and that these people are creating things, and they don't look, they, they, they're not necessarily looking a little bit further down the timeline at the end user result. And so I constantly am talking to technology entrepreneurs that might say they're making, you know, um, graphene nanoscale meshes for desalinating membranes. I was like, no, to the average person, you're making ocean water are drinkable, and that many more people resonate with that. And so I'm constantly pushing entrepreneurs to de-jargonize themselves and talk about when your microgrids in Africa help young girls get education. That's your limp, that's your, your throughput. So with all of that stuff, how, do I lead with green? Absolutely, 100%. I lead with social, I lose with impact. Yeah. I, there's not a day that goes by that I don't use the word impact a lot of times. So. <laughs> he does. <laughs> impact me a burger. <laughs> Kevin. Uh, and first of all, you're, you get a featured question just for you. Um, being the wine guy for EMA, uh, we're going to take care of you too. Uh, here's your, so Kevin, uh, in the racing world was probably the antithesis of a clean industry. So tell us a little bit about the, 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 the racing world and, and maybe a little bit how that filters over into the, car, the real car world and some of the changes, uh, Formula E. Uh, the regenerating brakes, blah, blah, blah. All right, how much time I got? You got two minutes. <laughs> uh, all right, so a couple things. Uh, people would look at the racing world as being, uh, you know, highly bad on the carbon footprint, uh, all sorts of things that are wasteful. And in some ways, there needs to be R&D done somewhere to help generate the things and the profits that we have today, not just on money. For instance, uh, let's talk about shape for a second. You guys hear the words when you buy a car or a minivan, it talks about the CD, the coefficient of drag. And the way it works is uh, a straight up box looking at the wind, going straight through the wind is a 1.0. And as you learn to cheat the air and change the shape, it drops down to a 0.5, a 0.4, a 0.3. And where do you think that, uh, that technology was discovered when people were trying to go faster on the salt flats, faster in Indianapolis, all of a sudden they realize these shapes make a difference. But what it does for the streetcar is it lets us go further with less. And we're talking about a monster amount of change just from the old days. Hmm. I grew up here in the 70s playing tennis. So I was a Southern California tennis brat. And going from Newport Beach to Pasadena, playing at Arcadia and going home, my lungs would be hurting when I got home. Look around now, there's twice as many cars and 90% less hmm. pollution. Hmm. Still not perfect, but we've gone a long way in that sense. You know, the last one you know, we like to talk about too is I love this new uh, uh, KERS system that's out there, a little more on your side of the world, but Kinetic Energy Recovery System is a new system that's been developed and they're pioneering it in Formula One. So when you break with your minivan, your suburban, whatever, when you break from a stop from 80 miles an hour down to zero, your car generates energy, but that energy is dissipated usually in heat through the brakes and other things. They have a recovery system with a flywheel system that's been developed that captures that energy, stores it in a battery, and then uses it later for acceleration. And that system is being developed for the streetcars, and just imagine how much that would save. Mm -hmm. All of it from racing. Excellent. The, uh, my wife whines when I drive a, a, a friend, an environmentally friendly car, and I allow the brakes to do that. and Because, you know, it, mm -hmm. it does it throw, it, it, so she'll, she's out there somewhere, but uh, she, <laughs> she'll go, quit, quit doing that, quit doing that. Just drive it regularly. Uh, but I can't help it. You, it's, it's fun to see if you can stretch it out how far. Good. Uh, uh, Garrett, I want to go to you for, for one. Give me a, a little longer answer for you and then we'll come back to everybody. Uh, what's the greatest challenge in the industry, in your industry, uh, that, that you face, and uh, especially as in regards to sustainability, and what do you think that can happen to overcome that? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so we're currently working on a project that's focused on uh, resilient food and water systems, climate adaptation to make those systems more resilient, why those systems? because they're fundamental. Everything else that we want to fix in the world doesn't matter much if folks aren't uh, fed and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, their houses aren't on fire. 
Um, so the greatest challenge for us working at the early stage, and the very first panel talked about this, about sort of who's the first mover in the capital stack. So our greatest challenge is really the unknown unknowns. So there, there's lots of incremental progress being made in existing industries, but for real solutions to the real big problems, it's obvious that we don't know the answers yet. Mm -hmm. And so who's gonna fund the experimentation and the exploration? And so we're, we're, we're adopting a lot of the models from the venture industry to discover new things. But we also need new forms of capital. I was struck, you know, you know talking about that, that fusion opportunity. That's a 25-year de-risking business model. You can't pitch that to a 10-year venture fund. <laughs> It just does not compute, I'm sure you do. But, um, but so, trying to bring in um, long-term capital that's risk tolerant and that is comfortable with the concept of investing in innovation itself and investing in the problem set itself uh, in order to discover the solutions that are gonna emerge and become scalable and gonna become you know, tomorrow's lift. I assume That's easier today than it was 10 years ago. I would assume that, did, are doors open more or are they still tough, you still banging on them? Oh, well, you know, there's a lot more talk about it, yeah. but I think this yeah. fundamental challenge of, um, if, if you are a thought leader or a subject matter expert, to say, yeah, I don't really know what the answer is, um, mm -hmm. and, and really authentically embrace um, talent discovery and risk tolerant development. That, that, that's just behaviorally challenging for any human being, no matter how the culture evolves. Yeah, I'll bet. Come on back, everybody answer it, real, same thing. Come on back everybody with uh, biggest challenge from an environmental standpoint and is it, over, is it overcomable? You know, again, I think our biggest challenge within the producer side, we've pretty much accomplished. Um, the biggest thing we have with us is, is glass and probably the grapes and all that in our industry is all, recycl all recyclable. Mm -hmm. and I think for us it makes you know, personal choices on how we, we push it. Even, even for me as the CEO of the company and how we do it at the offices and you know, I, I look at it, there's corporate culture and you're influencing individual decisions and we try to do both in the industry if we can. We want people to want to recycle, we want them to consciously take their bottle, whether it's beer or wine and to recycle it. You know, for us, um, that's our biggest thing, obviously what we do with the grapes and, uh, and uh, you know, other products, but we're really pretty much inside our footprint. I'm sure within the grower side again, there's more that can be done, but it's back to what we discussed that it can be, um, there's a point of, of uh, diminishing return on where you can get a, a return on what you're trying to do and still put a good product out for the, for the public and uh, satisfy your bottom line. Yeah, I would imagine there's some there's some compromise periodically with with um, what makes the best wine. Well, just for instance, right? you know, you hear about this thing they call it. Uh, you know, there's a root louse uh, that comes into our industry every 15 or 20 years that attacks the roots of these plants and then destroys a vineyard. And so when you look at the footprint that has to be done to completely replant, you know, rip up and replant a vineyard and start over and have lost its production for three to five years mm -hmm. because you weren't using the proper amount of a pesticide that's 90% less than it was 10 years ago. You know, those decisions they they ebb and flow for sure. But we have always in invasionary things happening and pesticides are there for a reason. Yeah, I'll bet. You know, but they're small. True. Uh, I think, th I've always be believed that the greatest hope for nature is in fact science and technology, which that seems to be at loggerheads. And there's three challenge areas, I feel. Uh, one is we have a ticking clock and we need things to move faster and faster, mm -hmm. much like Professor Dennison said. The other thing is education and storytelling. These are two different things. The first panel today was about educating philanthropists about how they can get involved with the technology that's gonna save nature. Early stage clean tech energy investment is one of the best things we can do. And finding exotic sources of capital to do this, like philanthropies, like Will and Jada's foundation, know nothing about technology, but it invests in something that just got a follow-on investment from a very large uh, multi-VC uh, thing I can't mention just yet, sorry. <laughs> uh, and the other thing is storytelling, to, to motivate people as to the, the, the thoughts are real, but their solutions are here. We have all the science in our knowledge base, it just needs to get out of the lab. And there's techniques to do that, and that's what I'm dedicated to, and Tom is dedicated to storytelling. Uh, so storytelling, education, and know that mm -hmm. there's a ticking clock, and that science and technology is our friend. Let's do it. I, I, Impact. I, I, Impact. Impact. Tom. What a, so it's what Drew said. 
point that. Yeah. I just said, we're, I said yeah. Yeah. That's what, you can't go wrong. I mean, just like point to Drew. Um, and then have a drink of water. Yeah. Um, I, better storytelling, I mean, for sure. In the, in the advertising world, too, I think, you know, there's a, we live in this sort of campaign structure where that has a, you know, a pre-launch and a launch and a post-launch. And it's like this little sort of confined space. Um, but we just got to tell better stories and get people excited about it because, you know, if, when, people, when people are genuinely excited about things um, um, and you make it interesting for them, they pay attention. Mm. And so, you know, I mean, we've had a lot of, I mean, Andrew's here, is, I've, I see a lot of people that have been involved in movies and documentaries, but how do we get in comedies and how do we, are, how do we, how do we invade, invade pop culture in a very positive, exciting, fun way? Um, and, and tell a story in a way that people are going to get super excited. Mm -hmm. Because the academic part of the story is the academic part of the story. And I was like, yeah, that's, 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 that's hardcore, like dark green stuff. Mm -hmm. The light green, you know, th th that, are, um, that people genuinely want to participate in the dialogue. I was one of those people. Generally, I, mean, I didn't know. I, was, I, I went from knowing nothing to being on the leadership committee of the NRDC. Mm -hmm. Talk about being like, wait. How did that happen? <laughs> um, Quickly. Well, everybody's like, oh, I'm just listening. And the, the, but again, it's, it's better storytelling, it, making it more exciting, making it more accessible. And the last thought is, is staying positive. I mean, I think mm -hmm. it's easier to be a bummer, but people just generally speaking don't like to be around bummer subjects. <laughs> so making it, I mean, right? I mean, it's like, ah, it's like oh, this is going to be a bummer conversation, a bummer person, a bummer thing, a bummer whatever. <laughs> but like make it fun and make it interesting and make it engaging. And um, the next generation of people, the next generation of kids, I should say, right? Um, that's what fires them up. Stand for something and, and get them fired up. And yeah. stuff will happen. Yeah. Yesterday I did a, 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 one of the dealerships. We had a, a science fair. And I was amazed not only at what they were presenting as their projects and how passionate they were, but about just their little social interaction. We'd mic these kids up and they'd go off 8, 10, 12 years old. And they were polished and ready to go. And it was fascinating. Yeah. Who, what kind of car dealership does a science fair? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Right. There you go. Impact. Impact. It was just Impact. one of them. We were spinning the, in, at 8 o'clock in the morning for something else. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Jana, come back and, and finish it up. So Last one. I'll, I'll piggyback um, the storytelling, I think, is so important. And I think really, from a marketing perspective or just from a connection with people perspective, it really comes down to motivation. And sometimes it seems like people have, uh, you're just like, oh, I'm not going to ever reach that person. They don't care anything about the environment. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll give a, a personal example. I was speaking um, to uh, a Tacoma driver. He's a truck driver in Texas. And um, we were talking, we got on the subject of environmental and the environmental challenge for 2050. And, you know, it was an interesting conversation, but it turns out that he's an avid fisherman. So then mm -hmm. you get to, okay, he cares about fishing. Yep. He cares about the quality of his rivers and streams. So how do you tie that back to what we're doing as a company? How do you tie that back to what matters to you personally? And I think that sometimes we lose sight of that. We've got our campaign development process and our messaging and oh, this is going to be, this is going to connect with all of our customers. But I think it really does boil down to that personal connection and what motivates people. Mm -hmm. And how do you tell people about what you're doing as a brand in a way that impacts and connects with them mm -hmm. and lets them know that you have a product that they can stand behind personally. I think that's really important. <laughs> Outstanding. I love watching and listening to everybody and how they've taken and expanded what they do and, and, and taken it into such a broader uh, platform. So thank you all so much. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.